Hey everyone, welcome back for another segment on our focus on machine learning at scale and what's happening with Intel in the world of machine learning and AI. And I'm so excited to have our next guest, Raymond Lowe. Hey Raymond, how are you? Just unmuted. Hello, good to <laughs> talk to you today. Good to talk to you, Raymond. Raymond, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you're doing over at Intel these days. Sure. Uh, again, um, I'm at Intel right now, working on something called the Open Fino. So my title right there is the Evangelist. So often you may see me giving talks, writing demo, or you may see me in the forum answering questions for people related to that toolkit. Cool. So. Raymond, you're going to show us some demos, and and this is what I want the audience to think about. And this is, you know, this might be a way for people to think about the questions that they can ask. Let's now, do it. Let's jump directly to demo. Yeah, why don't you get the demo ready? And and what I would just say is, when you're thinking about this, often people will ask, "What are the use cases for this? What is the real world examples of this?" And one of the things we were talking about beforehand was like how there's really this combination effect. You can mm -hmm. measure anything, right? You can measure a table. You can measure the distance, anything. But, you've, but you previously had to do it mechanically. And now what Raymond's going to show is how you do that with information, really. And I think that's the difference. So Raymond, I'd love to... So let's see what you have here. Perfect. So I hope you can see my screen right now. So what I'm showing you right now is an example of running depth sensing like finding out 3D information and doing inferencing, which is like finding out what's in the picture at the same time. So on the left side, you can see me, the person, right? Recognized by the machine learning, which by the way, right now I'm showing this running on a camera itself, which I'll explain what that camera means. It's all hardware accelerated and in real time. So you can see right now on the right side, you have a, some, sort, some sort of heat map. It's showing you the distance so things that's red means it's close to you, blue is far, green is in between. And if I stand up right now, so it can tell you, now we, a person is on the chair. So all this are happening right now in real time on this piece of hardware. If you can see my, to look at my camera, so the camera can see my camera right now. So this piece of hardware is now doing all this computations in real time. And inside the camera has something called the neural stick, which is like a PPU, um, a hardware accelerator, a hardware accelerator to do all this computation inside that chip. Okay. And I gotta stop in for a second. All right. Does it work? Do you guys all see it? It was all just now. Okay, great. You know, we're having a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a a gargle, I think, in in the tran in the transmission here, um, but one of the things that I would love to you know ask you about is what's happening now in these communities because these you know you work with a number of partners right, mm -hmm. and there's lots of new devices and this is using OpenCV. That's and OpenCV maybe can explain that to us a little bit what it is. But what right. is that? What is that intersection that we're starting to see here with this, with the, with the, with the hardware, and then building the software into it? So I think you mentioned one thing quite critical is the the rise of all this hardware and community effort to bring AI together into like one effort, right? So when we talk about OpenCV, for example, just now the demo was done by the company called Lasonius. It was part of the OpenCV alliance. They worked together to put the one of the biggest, oh, by the way, OpenCV is one of the largest open source computer vision library that I started using since I was in the 20s. Uh, and then basically they worked together to create this device so people can do depth sensing and AI together uh, on this hardware. And what we're seeing right now is, um, this is one example, but we have other companies like um, AD Link is one of our partner also integrating this hardware and our software into a package so that developer like you today can take on the AI challenge, but instead of putting 10 millions of dollars of investment of in the hardware, now you have a toolkit to enable a lot of like, for example, your new ideas, 
and prototype with a, like within a thousand dollar instead of like a ten million dollar problem. Ah, uh, so that's the difference is in the cost and the price. And then, so how's that? How's that affecting what developers are doing? What are you seeing developers doing now? And mm -hmm. what? How are you trying to meet what they're doing with you know with your own you know roadmaps? So I would say I'll bring a little bit back to the history of myself because I have an engineering and computer science background. I think what happened to the developer when I was a developer 15 years ago, when I was trying to work on AI, you have to go nitty gritty down to the C++ library to try to solve that problem yourself, right? And today is a much, much different landscape because people can come in with a laptop, let's say your Intel laptop today, and we have open Fino that can do AI inference, accelerate it on that piece of hardware that already you have it in your hands. You don't have to make any additional purchases to enter the field. You can almost think about you can drive, but you can get like a car that's like for a dollar, right? Compared to you have to buy a car, go through the whole driving lessons. Mm. And there's so much benefit to the community. So when you're thinking about that, you know, one of the things is like, how do you think about open v Vino in your in your overall tool chain? How, uh, how, yeah. how you know, and there's lots of we were talking about this earlier. There's lots of options out there. Great. It's the open source part of it, though, I think is unique here that maybe we can talk a little bit about. Like, how do you help people think about that and and toolkit environment that is becoming, you know, really important in, in, in the choice that developers make? Mm -hmm. Let's start with the open source part because um, yes, yeah, so open Fino stand for open, oh right, open, right? Open Fino and official inference and neural uh, inferencing. So why that is like, I think, why I think this is a, such a big momentum is now people first, they have all the hardware ready. Like as long as you have a Intel CPU or if you have an FPGA from Intel, you have a large landscape of devices that can run this. And now it's open source. So it created the, the, the two giants, right? The giants of all the hardware availability and the software availability because now you're available to tingle, to change, to optimize for your business solution. I think that's like one of the coolest thing I'll say I have worked on so far um, in my prior experience. Uh, so that's why I'm here today, right? I'm the evangelist. Because back then, just a couple of years ago, I was running a startup trying to build a piece of hardware, which is an augmented reality headset. That effort taught me a lot of lessons. One is like the hardware and software availability. Because of those two bottlenecks, it cost me so much time and money and engineering effort to bring it together to ship a product. It it, it, it was that engineering effort. So, what are you adding to the? What are you adding to Open Vino today to make it more accessible? I think the community is actually um, that. That's the other thing that I really enjoy working with. Like, um, so after that's available, I start seeing people come together. Uh, it never happened before without this kind of setup, because now if I go to a forum, people will share their knowledge. They come together to give back, uh, especially when I work with the OpenCV team. A lot of people, they're very open to sharing knowledge, teaching each other. Uh, that's, that's, I don't know, that, that doesn't seem natural in the beginning, but once it happened, it's become like a new norm to us now. So. One of the things that is interesting about Open Vino is the open model. Um, mm -hmm. it, and then there's this open model zoo. Yes. And is that a way for people to create their own models and add them to the Open Vino project? Yes. Oh, okay. So I will explain even further. That open model zoo is like, um, it's an effort of bringing the entire AI open community into one place. Um, maybe I have to explain what it means to us. What that when we talk about the open model. When we think about open Fino, you want to find a way to deploy a solution to a piece of hardware, like say an Intel CPU or GPU, to run the inference. To do that inference, there's a piece of puzzle called pre-trained model. Basically what happened is people collect a lot of images, can be let's say videos, they do analysis so that it will solve a task. One task could be image classification. Like very simple one, classify as a banana, oranges, or apple because they want to do a grocery checkout. And then usually people will already collected the information and train the model. And that piece of model live in the internet, right? 
So what open models do is we're gonna put them all together into one repository and it's optimized as well, optimized for our hardware. So people can now pick and choose. Imagine now you're doing a startup. Now you can pick a couple of those models, combine them together, possibly like a cocktail style. You may get a new solution that you never heard of or even never imagined is possible, but the amount of time it takes for you to get it done is much, much, much lower. Mm, that that's at the time, and you know we saw that in the emergence of container technologies, uh, mm -hmm. you know, seven years ago or so, when Docker started showing how you know you could build on top of the Linux kernel with the you know packaging a container in a different way than it had before. I think Solomon Hikes once said to me it was like before it was like trying to operate a you know. Um, um, a landing on the moon, right? You know, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're trying to like just get it just right, and if you miss, you would you could top potentially, you know, um, lose a lot of the work that you did. Um, right. So now with uh, you know now with this process though, how are you how are you thinking about continuous development? Then I mean, you're a software engineer. I mean, continuous development is something that has been in vogue for a little while. Mm -hmm. How do you think about that with machine learning and how, and how are people thinking about that kind of in the community? I start to feel um, the dynamic is a lot different than back then because once we lower the barrier entry now, it's like the first camera phone before internet, right? That time, if you, let's say, want to do a social media app, <sighs> where's the phone, right? There's like a, where's the hardware and software and platform to enable you? So today when you come on board, you already have a uh, success story people deploying this system. We have um, example of how to deploy and maintain your solutions. And I think more importantly as a software engineer is, um, is the updates, right? How can we still catch on with the latest trend without restarting? So with this toolkit, um, I find like, that's how our partner and I, when we work closely together, I see they leverage some of the hard engineering work we've done, like all the optimizations, they're very difficult. Even I had a PhD in that field, I may have to restudy for every right. different model, right? But now we put it into one location where people can share. I see that dynam dynamically is so different from in the past. It's like now today, when you're trying to write an app, you can get it done like in a reasonable time frame. but no longer you need to build up the whole thing. And that's amazing for us. So then let's go back to that kind of concept of this combination effect then. What is the combination of training and inference, you know, having then on, you know, on, on what developers are actually doing? Are they, are they able to, uh, you know, create this ensemble of models more easily? Are you starting to see that? And what are some of the ways that you're trying to advance that capability? Because you know, the scale out providers, they're doing that all the time, right? If you look at Alexa, I mean, it has, you know, it's built on lots of models, right? Perfect. You know? and, and so now, you know, now with, you know, with the work that anyone is doing is going to get to that point. But what we always see is this trailing effect, right? So uh, I ran about two to three hackathons so far. So mm -hmm. it's a great thing that I learned from the community, how they use the tool, how they turn idea into like a prototype to ideally go to the market. What I find is um, people right now, the way, uh, for example, uh, one of the people that try was tracking cows. I'm not kidding. Like they want to track the cow's face so that they can identify what the cows is. So that let's say Alex named them Joe, and then they can feed them accordingly. Like when I talk to the developer there, like how to get started, they say, oh, because I know how to train the face. But well, now because I just need to change what the faces are, I use a cow's face. He managed to pull a prototype in a month. And that was very new to us because when I was in school, when I think about face recognition, it required PhD work <laughs> just on that one topic. And then now people are taking those concepts, like tweet, twitch them a little bit, relearn a little bit, but they're able to create a new solution that can be heavily needed because farming is a huge problem in many countries and yeah. having that is a big deal. So do you have any last demos you can show us before we go? 
Uh, I would love to. What well, did it work last time? That's another thing. Maybe just show your hardware you got there around your desk. I think I think Raymond has a whole house full of. Uh, I have of, uh, so many things. I have this. I have that. I have this. I have that. <laughs> uh, I can run in the demo. Uh, where were I just now? I was. Uh, so you said it was a little bit laggy, right? So it was a little bit, but not. I mean, you could still get get a picture. Okay, how do you end a one? Okay, this is basically never done before. So bear with me, guys. Yeah, if it time. works, let's celebrate. Okay, are okay. we all ready? <laughs> uh, let's say this is a case. Right, let me try this right now. All right, we're gonna see a demo here. We got uh, all Raymond. right. I got Raymond's a shirt. Got one the, small yeah, screen. All right. This is only one small screen. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay, great. Do you see me? Oh, yeah. So oh, this is that. how you look at my eye. Oh, okay. wow. This may make me look really weird on the internet, but this is the reality now. <laughs> so what happened right now is we're doing gaze estimation based on the open CV, I'm open CV, uh, open Fino and open CV at the same time. So what you're seeing is it's tracking my eyeball and knowing where I'm looking at. And then when I tilt my head, it knows my orientation. I've seen a partner trying to make this on um, like deploy it so that people can do exams with it. So one of the problem in COVID right now is when the students are doing exam, they can look away and then look at something, right? So this way can help them to know if the person is looking at the exam paper, but not doing something else. It was a fun thing. And then that's exactly one thing that we enable our partners to do. Okay, I gotta stop sharing my weird face there. Hold on for a second. All right, so, and this is done from this camera as well, and just with the color camera just now. That's amazing. Well, Raymond, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. This has been fun. I wanted to just do a quick discussion with you. We'll have to follow up for some more for, for some more demos of this stuff. I, I was just thinking, gosh, you know, just I, I would hate I would hate it if someone had one of your that last demo. Uh, Technology. If we were, I was in a Zoom call and the and the, and the meeting was a little bit slow. I mean, we'd see my <laughs> eyes tracking all over the place. <laughs> yes, and this is the same for driving and many things. So, but that's exactly what I mean by enabling our partners. And right. I'm getting a heart attack right now. Oh, that was scary. I've never done this. So, thank you, Alex. <laughs> Thanks so much, Raymond. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you very much. Bye.